Hi, everyone. This is Alex Epstein, host of Power Hour, and this is another intro to a best of Power Hour. As I've mentioned in previous weeks, I'm working on the Moral Case for Fossil Fuels 2.0, and my co-hosts Don Watkins and Stefan Henna are helping me, so we are just bringing you some of our favorite episodes from the past. Today's episode features a really interesting guy named John Christie. Now, John Christie is one of the pioneers in satellite measurement of temperatures, and he really has a tremendous knowledge of climate science, and I find that he, he tends to be very in touch with the at least big picture reality of climate because he's constantly immersed in the big picture data. And I really enjoyed this episode, and I think that you will too. So enjoy, and I'll be back next week with another Best of Power Hour. Power Hour. Coal. Oil. Natural gas. Power Hour. The show where today's top energy experts break down today's top energy issues. No sound bites. No talking points. No nonsense. No BS. No softball questions. No vagueness. Just in depth analysis and ruthless clarity. Power Hour. Here's your host, Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm your host, Alex Epstein. I want to read you a quote from an article I was pointed to recently that I thought was really good. It begins with, why do we argue about climate change? The reason there is so much contention regarding quote-unquote global warming is relatively simple to understand. In climate change science, we basically cannot prove anything about how the climate will change as a result of adding extra greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So we are left to argue about unprovable claims. And I recommend reading the rest of this. It's an article by John Christie, a uh, climatologist, uh, Alabama state climatologist, actually, and um, a professor of atmospheric science at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And uh, I've been following Dr. Christie for a while, but I particularly like this, this article um, because it really focuses on what is known and what isn't known and, and how and makes it very accessible to a layman. The, the title, which I don't actually think is the greatest, is Climate Science Isn't Necessarily Settled, um, which you can get at centerdaily.com, C-N-T-R-E daily.com, but if you just search John Christie, C-H-R-I-S-T-Y, Climate Science Isn't Necessarily Settled, uh, it'll come up. By the way, the whole uh, settled thing, I just... I think that's the the wrong way to think of of um, like good or bad in in knowledge. But anyway, uh, I saw this article. I really wanted to bring Dr. Christie on the show. Unfortunately, he agreed, so he'll be on, and we'll be talking about this article and um, more broadly. I think what how how laymen can think about these issues and what the evidence is and isn't. And I'm going to ask him some. Uh, I don't know if they'll be challenging for him, but. Questions I think are, are are challenging, including some that are raised by uh, Dr. James Hansen, who's probably the most famous climatologist in the world. So, on the other side, we'll have Dr. John Christie. Power Hour, because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. We're joined now by Dr. John Christie, professor of atmospheric science at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, and also Alabama State climatologist. Dr. Christie, welcome to Power Hour. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. So um, a colleague of mine recently pointed me to an article of yours called Climate Science Isn't Necessarily Settled. And one of the things I really enjoyed about it was that it had a major emphasis on what has and hasn't been uh, demonst demonstrated in climate science. Could you give us an overview of, of sort of the key things that we talk about that have and haven't been demonstrated? Okay. In general, we know that uh, the greenhouse gases of the atmosphere have been increasing. So we can measure and prove that that is the case, whether it's uh, carbon dioxide or methane, any of those gases. And we also know something else that we can prove in a laboratory is that when you insert extra greenhouse gases into a jar of air, for example, that that air will absorb more heat and therefore uh, warm up. Now, that's about the extent in terms of what we can absolutely say we can prove. Now, in the atmosphere, 
with the extra greenhouse gases, what we cannot prove is what is going to happen to the real atmosphere. It turns out, relative to a jar of air in the laboratory, the atmosphere has many, many components, thousands, millions of components that can cause either more warming or less warming. And so our models that are used to kind of predict are just unable even to replicate what the current climate is doing, much less give us much confidence about what might happen in the future. Um, so, I mean, some people, some, um, let's say, believers in catastrophic global warming would say that, uh, you know, there are other issues where there's a high degree of understanding, or maybe you can't exactly measure, but but it's still very well understood. So in uh, James Hansen, in his book and in other places, uh, talks about how, well, what we can understand is that there's a certain energy balance, and we understand that CO2 has... A, fairly significant impact on that energy balance. And then we understand that there are positive feedbacks involving water vapor uh, heating up the earth and changing the climate. What's your response to the sort of status of those kinds of claims? Well, those kinds of claims have not been proven. For example, Jim Hansen has a model. It's called the uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies uh, Climate Model. And in that model, there is the climate feedback of water vapor as he perceives it. Well, we actually build data sets from scratch of the global climate system. We can compare his model output with the real world, and his model output fails terribly in trying to reproduce what is actually happening in the world over the past 35 years. Therefore, it's a pretty easy assumption or a conclusion to make that his model has the improper feedbacks. Uh, it, it's a very simple demonstration, as we've done in, in numerous places, including congressional testimony and in federal court. Um, I mean, I think one of the, just to play devil's advocate for a little longer, I think one of the responses we hear to that, and particularly in the you know flattening of uh, global average temperatures in the past 15 or so years, is the idea that, yes, it's a straw, it, you know, yes, there are these these other elements that we can't anticipate, but you know, it's there's this basic dynamic of the energy balance, and we're, you know, adding the equivalent of 4,000, 400,000 Hiroshima bombs a day to the atmosphere. And over time, just like the Earth moving closer to the sun would warm it over time, even if more, you know, immediate effects counteracted that for a year or two, for sure it's going to get a lot warmer unless we stop using fossil fuels. Okay, that's all speculation, and that speculation is built into the climate model infrastructure, and we have shown that to be false, and we are not talking here about only 15 years, and that's one of the things I like to use satellite data for. It goes back 35 years, even before the last 15 years of the pause, which climate models fail to catch. The models were already too warm. I wrote an article in Nature in 1994 well before the pause, demonstrating that models were about four times warming the air about four times faster than the real world. And the thing here is that the atmosphere is so complicated, it has many ways to expel that heat that climate models do not have. And so with that ability for the real world not to retain that heat, and that means the temperature just simply doesn't go up like models claim it should. It should. Yeah, as a non-expert in this field, that's what that's what bugged me when I read Hansen's account is that he just there seemed to be this assumption that no matter what, uh, that energy would be uh, retained, and I, I didn't see how you could prove that uh, for certain, especially given what I knew of the the general trends of the actual temperatures. Well, if energy is going to be retained, we should be able to measure it, right? That's simple. Uh, science. We can't find it. It's not there. Therefore, the notion in the models that the energy should be retained in the atmosphere is falsified. Um, that something about the atmosphere contains, and we are studying these processes right now, something about the atmosphere, primarily cloud distribution, we think, is preventing that heat from being retained in the atmosphere. It's a natural response, in other words, sort of like a thermostat, a natural response of the climate system not to retain that 
extra heat. Um, one thing I, I am just enjoying about the way you're responding to these questions is that it's, it's very matter of fact in terms of you actually have to demonstrate something and point to evidence, which, you know, in my own more, much more limited science education, that's what you were taught. And yet today you hear claims, I was just scanning over some of what Hansen was saying, they'll talk about, oh, well, we validated this using models, which seems circular. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, they will take a time period of change, let's say 1930 to 1980 or something like that, tune the model to that time period and then run the model and say, look how good our model did with this temperature time series. Well, that's about as circular as you can get. Um, we, however, build data sets of components of the climate system that the modelers do not tune to, and we are able to demonstrate that they are way off. And uh, until we see some models that actually represent what the atmosphere is really doing, I would not trust them for any type of scientific result, nor certainly for policy implications. Right. I mean, it seems, it seems that the state of climate models is far, far worse than the state of, say, economic models. And those, even the best economic model in the world, as, as we've sort of seen, can lead you to very bad consequences if you follow it dogmatically because you've heard it's the best by a bunch of authorities. Wow. Um, being compared with an economist is, a, <laughs> is kind of a low blow. <laughs> we sort of know what the equations are in physics. The problem with our models is they're so complicated we haven't gotten all of them together. In economic models, you've got that really tough factor of human emotion and decision making that I that is uh, almost beyond equation making. Although some of the economic models do do a pretty good job of, uh, you know, the macro kind of uh, way things uh, work. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole interesting methodological question, because obviously you have elements of the climate system that you can measure in a way that n nothing economic could remotely resemble. But at the same time, if we talk about sort of at least results, you have economic models and even economic theories, uh, for sure, that can, uh, I mean, even the theory of supply and demand has a lot of predictive power uh, numerically and, and certain views of the stock market. Now, if people overestimate their understanding of the causality, which is easy to do in something economics, for sure, but uh, I think I just take your point that we really, if somebody claims that he can predict the future, the question is, what is your evidence that you can uh, predict the future. And as you mentioned, with something like the energy balance, if you're claiming this long-term dynamic that's decisive, well, then you should be able to show that long-term dynamic, not just say, well, it hasn't shown up yet, but don't worry, it'll be there after you know, we ban fossil fuels. Yeah. When you say it that way, it sounds very unscientific, doesn't it? You know, I know it didn't work well now, but trust me, it will work in the future. And what we have shown is that in 102 which is all the climate model simulations that were available to us, every single one, all 102, overshot the actual temperature change of the last 35 years. That tells me there's something very wrong with even the basic theory of global warming, that it, the climate models are simply too sensitive to the extra CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. And I want to go back... Uh to the history uh, of this theory, because I've studied it a bit, but but I have a lot of questions about it. And I guess the first question is, when was the greenhouse effect first identified? And, and I think just as importantly, how was it viewed? Because it obviously wasn't viewed as a catastrophe widespread back then, because otherwise, you know, the global warming hysteria would have started, you know, a long time ago. Well, that is a bit of an interesting history that I know of. I don't know at all, but uh, Tyndale had some experiments where he demonstrated that uh, greenhouse gases absorbed energy and so therefore retained heat. Uh, Irenaeus did some calculations for the real atmosphere and uh, indicated that if greenhouse gases uh, warmed the atmosphere and the atmosphere behaved like a gas in a jar in a laboratory, then there would be a pretty good bit of warming. Of course, as we found through the years, the atmosphere does not behave like a gas in a jar in a laboratory. It's got all kinds of other things happening. Uh, there were times when especially those in the Soviet Union and Russia today uh, were happy 
about the thought of putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. I remember one fellow from uh, the 1980s who was advocating putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere because that would allow Russia to have a much longer growing season, you know, and expand its agriculture poleward and uh, really solve a lot of problems for them. Others have advocated for extra greenhouse gases because that's the way the planet used to be. We have about 400 parts per million now for carbon dioxide. Uh, I've heard the movement of 1,500 because that's the period when the planet had the most uh, 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 bio, uh, biosphere. The biosphere was most invigorated because when you think about it, CO2 is simply plant food. And putting more of that in the atmosphere is uh, uh, beneficial to the plants. Now, on the other side of that, we have seen the environmental movement uh, through you know, the United Nations and so on come together with the goal, essentially, of showing that this is a terrible problem, that putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is a terrible problem. And so they have these series of very expensive reports that have come out where they neglect uh, uh, scientists like myself and many others as they've slowly worked their way into selecting authors that have a particular point of view that will write the most uh, dramatic kinds of stories about uh, the dangers of carbon dioxide. So we had an interesting situation here with how this has evolved through the years. Well, I want to go back to some of, of the earlier views because I think it's there's I, th I think there's this assumption that exists today that if we have any impact, it must be bad. So the rest of nature, whatever impact that has on climate, terrific, doesn't matter, or is good, we assume that's perfect. And then any impact we have is bad. So basically the human race is the problem, which I sometimes call human racism. And it's I find it interesting to look back in the past and see, well, there are these theorists that actually anticipated uh, good consequences. Can you tell me uh, some of the names of those theories? I, I'm interested to to look them up. Um, well, off the top of my head, I, I can't recall. I just know that a number of us today are actually looking at these uh, consequences in terms of measurements. You can actually measure the increase in biomass over the last 25 years from some of our satellites that uh, measure uh, biospheric mass. And so this, we can see in the last 25 years an invigoration of the uh, ecology of the planet as a result of this extra CO2. Then we have um, the uh, um, uh, Nobel Prize winner, I can't think of his name right now, who was able to use a tremendous amount of skill in creating better sources of wheat. But Norman a big Yes, yes. That's enormous. Um, a big factor in that extra uh, productivity and extra yield was the extra CO2 we put back into the atmosphere. So this was a very been an extremely beneficial aspect of using carbon fuels uh, for the planet in the fact that we have a roughly a 20% increase in food production simply because of the extra CO2 we have put back into the atmosphere where it originally was. What is the state of the evidence about warming being correlated to all of these negative weather events? Because it seems like at, at once that, as far as I understand it, the basic theory, almost all the negative consequences come from warming. It's not like CO2 as a gas is causing hurricanes directly in their theory. But at the same time, the trends don't seem to bear that out. And historically, people wanted more warming. Well, you know, you're talking here to someone who's a climate scientist who actually, and there's only a few of us who actually build data sets from scratch. I mean, we go into the real records to find out what has gone on in the, as far back as we can go. And you're right that the climate alarmist movement has really been attracted to extreme events like tornadoes and hurricanes and droughts and so on. Well, those are things we actually can measure and we can count them, we can measure their intensity, and so on. And in all those cases you mentioned, none of those are increasing. There is no correlation between uh, the global temperature and these kinds of events. They happen on their own because of other sh um, uh, 
parts of the climate system that create imbalances that will always be there. We will always have tornadoes. We will always have hurricanes. We will always have blizzards. And you probably got a chuckle this past winter about how many times people were saying it was so cold because of global warming. Well, that doesn't make sense at all, and it can't in terms of science. What is the, I guess, I'd, even even on their premises, so so Hansen's premises, what is it? Is it that it's more water vapor in the atmosphere, so somehow everything goes haywire? I mean, there must be some at least like the theory well, that doesn't bear out. Yeah, there's a theory, and it's a quick and easy theory. It just doesn't make sense, is that if you add more energy to the atmosphere, you should have greater um, energetic storms. But the problem with that idea is that storms come about from gradients in temperature, not the absolute temperature, but you have to have cold against warm. And those kinds of gradients in temperature are what causes the storms, and those gradients are still with us. Uh, and if you warm up the poles faster than the equator, you reduce those gradients. So according to their theory, we should have fewer storms, not more. That's that's fascinating because just in you know what you learn a little bit when you study something like wind power is what is wind caused by, you know differences in heat, uh, as far as I understand. So that it makes perfect sense logically that that you know if if um, the warming would disproportionately affect the poles, which are obviously colder, you'd shrink that temperature difference and you'd have less of it. So it's. I guess one thing that strikes me about that, and I'm curious on your thoughts on this general phenomenon, is how bad the education is about this, where we're not, these things are not explained to us in a coherent way, in part because I think they're incoherent in many ways. But, you know, as a layman, it's very, very hard to even find out what's posited because there's so much of this idea of, well, 97% of scientists say it, so it's your your job to act, not to think. <laughs> Well, you know, we used to, they used to say in the media years ago, if it bleeds, it leads. And uh, so in a TV news hour, that's what happened. And so what leads in a news hour is a dramatic statement about the future that, of course, cannot be proven, but it certainly has some nice video clips you can add to it. Uh, coming on and saying, you know, the world temperature this year is average, no one gets that. A story across. It doesn't sell uh, in, in the eyes of the media. So getting good and accurate and boring information, but boring, but information that you can stand on in court under cross-examination, that's the kind of stuff I deal with. And what we found is the alarm is just not there in the climate system. So you mentioned the role of it, if it bleeds, it leads, and that's, that's clearly a dynamic. Um, but just looking at the trajectory of how people, you know, what people's expectations are, it seems like just there's this, there, it seems like there's this default expectation that if we're having any impact on climate, which, you know, we are in some way, that it must be bad. What about that, this more basic premise that when it's wrong for man, you know, to chant, to change nature? Well, yeah, you're getting into some um, sort of faith-based points here that uh, there is a group of people in the world who believe humans are kind of an infestation on the planet and that the perfect planet is one in which um, uh, we at most uh, live like uh, animals and that we have no infrastructure, no medical advances, nothing like that. We just live and die by the organisms that eat us and attack us in terms of bacteria or whatever. That, that's their sense of an Eden. Uh, whereas, you know, another view of the world is that this is, uh, uh, that humans are kind of important and they are valuable. And so uh, giving them that benefit of the doubt of being valuable in the world means that you will allow carbon-based energy to lengthen and enhance human life. And that seems to be anathema to uh, this particular environmental group of people that seems to be running a lot of places, um, that uh, whatever you do that encourages human life and lengthens it and makes it uh, uh, and enhances it is somehow wrong. Um, and so, you know, I kind of part company with folks uh, along that line. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, you mentioned earlier something that sounded very important. I, I didn't follow up on, the, uh, on up on at the time, 
which was that you are actually constructing, and you mentioned we, so I'm, I'm curious who else is involved, but you're constructing data sets from scratch, whereas most of the climate science community is not. Could you talk about what you are doing versus what others do? Uh, yes, uh, I suppose uh, Roy Spencer is a colleague of mine who works here in the Earth System Science Center of uh, UAH. Uh, we were the first to take satellite measurements and create a global temperature data set of the atmosphere. Now, this was back in the time when the only temperature data sets we had were from surface thermometers that were scattered around the world. There were different kinds of thermometers. They were affected by urban uh, growth and uh, um, farming practices and so on. So they didn't give you a good feel about what the true bulk atmosphere was doing. And so we were able to uh, generate from microwave sensors on polar orbiting satellites um, a truly global data set, and it shows this you know, this lack of warming compared to climate models and still does after 35 years now. Um, and uh, we have another great uh, uh, aspect of that data set is that we can independently uh, check it against balloon measurements. And, and the two are, are, are extremely close. So we have high confidence that we are seeing what the real world is doing and it's not doing much in terms of changing its temperature. Uh, so uh, that's just some of the work we do in terms of uh, uh, climate data sets. Um, and then um, how how are other, it sounds like others in the field are, they're not doing that. Obviously not everyone is going to have the same specialization, but it sounds like others are in some way ignoring that or, or taking dogmatically a data set that they haven't constructed and that's not really validated. Is that accurate? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> this is very common in our field is to, you know, come to your conclusion first and then go out and try to find a data set that matches your conclusion. Uh, it's kind of a backwards way to do anything, but uh, that happens in, in climate science. Uh, remember, I hope your listeners realize that climate scientists are just people and people believe what they want to believe. And so we find that, uh, you know, if they find a surface data set with lots of warming or particular place on the earth that's changing, they will point to that and say, ah, that's due to mankind. And a good example is the polar ice caps. They will look at the North Pole and say, the ice cap is melting there, it's our fault. They do not look at the South Pole where the ice cap is expanding. And your listeners may find it unusual to hear this, but it turns out when you add both of them together, the total sea ice right now is above average by about a million square kilometers. So, um, you know, you can pick the data set you want to uh, confirm your bias. And in climate, there are just, it's a target rich environment. There's so many climate parameters out there. You can find one that agrees with your bias. In this context, what do you mean exactly by climate parameters? Oh, you can talk about glaciers on this particular mountain range. You can oh, talk oh, about oh. temperatures in this part of the ocean. You can talk about humidity in that particular city. You know, there's it's a target-rich environment. Um, so what – well, can you explain um, the relationship between weather – you mentioned that weather balloons and the satellites correlated. How do the, how do the balloons work? Okay, a, a balloon is filled with helium, and then it um, – uh, from a, uh, a little rope extended down from the balloon is attached a, uh, a little instrument package, a radio sound, we call it. And as the balloon ascends in the atmosphere, it radios back the signals of the temperature at each layer. The satellite looks down from the top of the atmosphere, obviously, it's up in space, and it also measures the temperature by layers. And so we can look at what the balloon says independently at that spot, versus what the satellite says at that spot. And when we see what we see, which are correlations extremely high, we know that the satellite is telling us the same thing the balloon is, which is what the temperature of that place is, of that column is. And so we have a, a, a nice way to verify, you know, that the satellite is telling us the true temperature of places around the world where, this, where we have no balloons. So we can get a truly global picture of the atmospheric temperature. What do you think is the the value in then using land based instruments? Because it, you know, there seem to be so many obvious hazards with using those. 
Well, the value of land-based instruments, and I have actually put out a network of these, uh, but in very pristine places, is that that's where we live. And so since we live at the surface, we would not want to know that if we live in a city, it does stay a lot hotter, especially at night, than it does in the country. So the utility company wants to know that, so they know how much power to have ready to keep air conditioners on at night, for example. So these differences in temperature at the surface are important simply because that's where we live and grow our food and so on. But in, and this is probably to your question, in terms of the effect of the greenhouse effect, they're not that good in telling us what's going on. That's left for the bulk atmosphere, the atmosphere from about the surface to, say, 35,000 feet where jet aircraft fly. So that layer of air is where the greenhouse effect is supposed to be evident, and that's what we can measure with the satellites and balloons. So to what extent in the current debate are satellite measurements used versus uh, ground-based instruments? Well, in the current debate, it's, it's pretty hard to get the satellite and balloon evidence in there because it doesn't, it's not dramatic. It doesn't show <laughs> rapid warming, and it certainly does not agree with climate model projections. So it's generally relegated to a minor role. Uh, folks really like the surface temperature data set to make an alarming story because they have these uh, some places that are warming quite a bit. But uh, as I said, the reason for that warming is probably not related to the greenhouse effect by and large. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you know, as a layman, there's always the challenge of how do you process these different claims in one one thing I like as a rule is, is that can I get, if I can get it, I want big picture data about trends. So if people say, oh, climate is becoming more dangerous, well, we have statistics on disaster related deaths and we see that those go down. And so that indicates to me they're cherry picking to prove their theory versus their theory is emerging from the fact. And so here, just in common sense, not that I know everything, but what you're describing satellite measurements doing seem much more big picture than you know, a weather station in the middle of Phoenix um, near asphalt or, or even something less of a caricature than that. And I, I just don't quite understand why, what would be their best argument for using those as against satellite measurements? I'll put it that way. Um, well, I guess that's a tradition. The surface measurements have been around a lot longer than satellites. And so you have people that are just wedded to the notion of surface temperature tells us everything about the climate, when in fact it probably gives us a wrong view of climate. It is the bulk atmosphere in which you have the true mass of the atmosphere that is truly affected by any greenhouse effect that you should be focusing on. That has been our claim, and, um, and, and certainly the models indicate that that is also where you should look for the greenhouse effect. And when we look for it, turns out to be a pretty small effect. So um, I, I agree with you. We are able to see with the same, think about this, the same thermometer on a polar orbiting satellite looks at the whole world. So it's not like it's a different thermometer there and a different thermometer there or, or whatnot. It's the same thermometer that measures the entire uh, global atmosphere uh, on a daily basis. So you've got a good calibration of that instrument. It also seems less susceptible to manipulation. I mean, unless you just, just somebody, I mean, maybe with the character of Mike Mann, uh, you could call that a cheap shot, but, you know, just manipulated the data set that came out of it. But if it's, if it has one instrument, it seems pretty much cause and effect. If either instrument is right or wrong, but it's not going to magically uh, measure things uh, in a biased right. way. That's a good point, is that you should always have more than one group uh, constructing in independent ways the data set from the original data. And there is that this group out in California that also generates the uh, tropospheric temperature data set. Their result is within one hundredth of a degree of our result per decade. So they're, they're li they line up extremely close, even though they constructed it completely independently from uh, the way we constructed the data set. That's, that's fascinating. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on just the, the issues? It, you've mentioned a couple of times just the way the atmosphere works in terms of where where the bulk of it is and how this relates 
uh, to greenhouse effect because I don't think most people have a sense of exactly the where all of this stuff is supposed to happen. It's just they have this idea uh, of a you know of a blanket that John Kerry so eloquently spoke about uh, in Indonesia. Right. Uh, well, the greenhouse effect, um, uh, without getting into too much physics, has an effect, and that effect is to warm up the atmosphere to balance the energy that comes in and out. In other words, it's like when you put a blanket on the atmosphere, the, the person under the blanket will start warming up to a point where the top of the blanket then releases the energy in balance. Uh, it turns out the way that works out in the atmosphere, there's actually more warming in the upper part of the atmosphere than at the surface. And so if you want to look for where the greenhouse effect is strongest, you go up about 30, 35, 40,000 feet and measure the temperature there because that's where it has the largest signal. And it warms up the most because of the way these greenhouse gas molecules absorb and emit heat up and down. Uh, like I said, I can't go into the physics of it, but, but that's just the effect. That's where you would go to look for it. And so that's why we think the satellites and balloons are terrific for that purpose, because they measure the temperature right there at that spot where it should be most obvious uh, to, uh, for the greenhouse effect to occur. What's the current, given that we've talked about what instruments are good and what their reliability is and what the hazards of certain ones are, What's the status of ocean measurement? Because that's something that is quoted a lot these days, in particular because they're not getting the, the weather results they want. So the ocean is the place where all the heat is, allegedly. Right. Yeah, the ocean has much, much more heat capacity. In other words, it can hold much more heat than the atmosphere. And I can say that the measurements are getting better, but they, for a long time, uh, are pretty uh, scattered. In fact, I've seen some examples where we are looking at the deep ocean heat content, and for the globe as a whole, we might only have 50 measurements in a month. Now, you think of how big the globe is, and if you only had soundings of the ocean in 50 places around the world, is that going to give you an accurate number? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a concerted effort to put out um, these descending buoys that are able to go down and up and down and up pretty much around a lot of the globe. And so in the last 10 years, we have a good idea. But the other problem here is that it only takes a tiny change in temperature to represent a huge amount of heat. And we don't yet have those uh, the precision to measure that level of heat change. And so someone can talk a lot about how, well, the ocean is eating the heat, that the, the, the heat is disappearing into the ocean because we can't find it in the atmosphere, obviously. And so that's excuse being made, but the problem there is we don't have the precision of even these buoys to measure that level of a thousandth of a degree to understand how much heat is going into the ocean. Interesting. Um, well, the final set of questions I want to ask that, you know, pertain to more the the political and institutional uh, side of this. You know, one one claim that we hear uh, frequently is that ninety seven percent of scientists agree, and then it's some very vague statement about global warming and scientists and whatnot. But what I mean, how do these things? Uh, get generated because you have those if you know if we go to the nasa site uh they'll you know cite all of these statements by scientific bodies which are usually pretty weaselly but still so many scientific institutions have gotten involved in at the very least endorsing this idea in some way although they almost never endorse the catastrophic scenario but they do they are on board with the political policies how has this institutionally become so big given the lack of evidence well, you know, institutions jump to conclusions like everyone else, but you must remember that these institutions are funded by governments, by and large. And so uh, making it sound like the government is correct in funding you for your results is a nice feedback cycle to assure continued funding. Um, 
uh, and I would just say this, that that 97% thing is, is just false. Uh, when you get down to how the studies on that were done, it almost says, it, it, well, it comes out to be, have humans had some effect on the climate? Well, I'm part of that 97% as a result. Now, when the American Meteorological Society surveyed its professional membership, this is over 1,000 people, when they asked him the question, has man caused most of the warming in the past 50 years, only 52% said yes. 52% is not a consensus, and it betrays the fact there is so much uncertainty about the climate system that you can only get 52% of the professionals to agree with that statement. And how many of those professionals are actually federal employees or funded through the government for the work they do to create the alarm? So it's a, it's a tough survey to, to swallow in some sense. So th it's interesting because I just pulled up the uh, a quote from that the, the society in 2012, and it says, it is clear from extensive scientific evidence that the dominant cause of the rapid change in climate of the past half century is human-induced increases in the amount of atmospheric greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, chlorofluorocarbons, methane, and nitrous oxide. So how did, how did this emerge from that poll? Well, uh, the society essentially, they did, not, they did not write that at the behest of the membership. That was a selection of people, a collection of people that was specifically uh, selected to be alarmist. Now, I would simply say, prove it, okay? Ask the society to prove it. They can't. What they will say is, but our model projections indicate that we can't get warming unless we have the CO2, to which I come back and say, look, I have your models. None of them, not one, reproduce what the climate has actually done. Therefore, you have not proven the statement you lead off with that's very alarmist. And that's terrible for society to base its science on speculation and not on observational fact. It's an embarrassment, and I'm a member, I'm a fellow of the society, yet uh, um, I find it an embarrassment to science and to our society specifically that they would say such a thing. Yeah, and I don't know if this is from the AMS one, but it's in others where they'll not only do that, but they'll make political economic statements, which on the face of it, given that it's an interdisciplinary question of what to do about energy uh, that they're commenting on. So, for instance, the American Physical Society says we must reduce emissions of greenhouse gases beginning now. So they're telling everyone around the world, your energy of choice, the energy that's keeping you alive, physics tells you stop using it. Well, this is where, and I, I testified before the APS uh, just last January because they are rewriting that statement. I think they got a lot of flack from their membership about going into the political sphere so hard like that. And, and as I say, I think I said it in this piece you referred to at the beginning, that you have to make, you have to ask the right question. And the right question is what is it, or how much do you value human life? Because there is absolutely no question that the amount of carbon you use is directly proportional to the length and quality of human life. And you can go on on your speculation about uh, climate change and so on, but right now there is no question that when energy is affordable and available, your people will live longer and better lives. No question. None of the advances you have seen in the past century, be they medical advances, transportation advances, um, the internet, uh, um, Wi-Fi, whatever you are involved in, none of that could have happened without carbon-based energy. And that carbon-based energy is recognized the world over as the best source of energy. Germany is completing 29 coal-fired power plants because they found their solar and wind is not able to pick up the energy they need. And of course, China, India, other countries are going full bore on carbon because that is the life-giving source of energy they have found and can afford. Going back to another aspect of these kinds of consensus and, and your point that climate scientists are people, I think that is a that's that's a hard point for people to swallow because they they view scientists as gods and even 
I found myself having this, even though uh, you know I studied quite a bit of science in college and and was with uh, went to a scientific research high school. There's still this tendency to think of them as the scientists, and they're all just these Isaac Newtons looking at the facts, and and that's all that matters. And they would never say anything disingenuous or misleading. Can you just elaborate on the idea that climate scientists are human beings? <laughs> well, I hope your listeners know that <laughs> climate scientists are human beings. They're not the robots. In terms like of the, the drawbacks, the bang, in know? terms of the negative capacities of, of human beings. Oh, well, well climate scientists um, are terrible at uh, coming to conclusions first and finding evidence to support that conclusion later. Uh, this is done so often in climate science, it, it's embarrassing. And uh, those who sit down and specifically look only at what facts are available come to completely different conclusion about how the climate works. Um, golly, uh, I, I, would, I would just say that you know, your listeners need to understand that that scientists are people that have views about their uh, human life, about the ecology of the planet, about the place of, uh, of, of humans in the system here, and that colors how they see things. And there's also another component, or many components, but another one is attention. Scientists generally don't get a much of attention, much attention, and yet when this climate thing came along, all of a sudden they're they're on television, they're in the newspaper, they're on the web. People revere them for their wisdom and knowledge, and so they just go out on a limb and say things they just shouldn't shouldn't say. Um, I, I've just been embarrassed to listen to a scientist walking through the Texas plains and saying, oh, this drought is caused by global warming, when you just have to look at the evidence to find there have been far worse droughts in Texas in the past. And and the and, and someone saying that just shouldn't. It, it's just embarrassing. Yeah, I, what I find equally morally objectionable. I mean, there's one thing of the the leaders, but then also the the lack of people standing up because just you know privately, I know full well that many 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 people disagree with this. They think it's hysterical, and yet for various I think economic and psychological disincentives, they don't speak up, and thus people like you are in uh, the minority publicly when really if that's not representative of their act of the actual state of opinion in the field uh right uh in fact i i received an email today from a high agency official you know who said do not uh he gave me some information that you know backed up uh the view i've proposed here been talking about he said but do not attach my name in any way to this piece of information uh, because as someone in the federal government, he's worried uh, that, uh, and it has happened, that people are um, uh, denigrated, they are uh, attacked, and so on. If they come out with any view that's different than the current administration, it's it's a dangerous place to try to be an honest scientist when it comes to climate uh, science, that's for sure. One final question about the institutional aspect my vague recollection of reading the history is just that at at some it's not that the field itself came to have the high climate sensitivity to c o two view and that was just this overwhelming thing that won out via merit as say you know quantum electrodynamics would you know to the extent that won out uh it it was more that you know certain political or ecological types found this particular interpretation of atmospheric science and jumped onto it and threw money at it. And so it, in an effect, got an unearned monopoly. How accurate is that? Well, I, I do think that, um, that the uh, hardcore environmental groups have made you know, hundreds of millions of dollars off this issue. Remember, their funding comes from people who have money, discretionary funds. So to scare them with the global warming issue is a way to uh, scare up some more money. Now, if they wanted to save the lives of people, they'd be dealing with malaria in Africa. They'd be dealing with the uh, vitamin deficiencies, very low cost, you know, cleaning up water. These are environmental issues that can be dealt with at low cost and save lives. But you see, those people in Africa, and I lived in Africa for uh, some years, uh, 
they don't contribute. They don't have any money to contribute. So you have to go after your donors, scare them into giving you some money. And the global warming thing is perfect because it assuages the guilt that rich people have. You know, oh, I'm terrible for the environment, but if I give you some money, you'll make me feel better. You know, it starts sounding like a religion, doesn't it? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's how this uh, environmental movement has really cashed in on the global warming scare. I think it's about ready to end, though. Uh, they've already seen uh, falls in funding as a result of this uh, issue, so they're going on to something else, I imagine. I guess what's the relationship? I mean, there's there's the funding, and I know people talk about the funding. Given that my primary interest is in philosophy, I'm more. I always tend to to look at the ideas, and and with you know a lot of these donors and then the the recipients, it seems non coincidental that they're very, very drawn to the latest alleged massive flaw in capitalism that makes them necessary to come to the rescue and control things. Oh, well, when you get into the economics, good out of my field, I do understand, uh, uh, you know, some of it in a basic sense. Um, Unfortunately, in economics, uh, versus what they're viewing in economics, you know, an uh, uh, economy works well when someone has a free decision to make to spend his wealth on some sort of good or service that he gets in return. Uh, when a third party comes in and says, "No, you can't do that. I'm going to make you buy this kind of electricity from the solar power or something. It's more costly. It doesn't serve your needs well, but you know, I'm going to force you to do that." That all of a sudden reduces the impact of an economy and its ability to employ its people and to be vigorous and uh, uh, you know ha- have an active uh, influence on as many people as possible, positive influence on as many pe- people as possible. So this notion of uh, uh, trying to destroy an economy or, or capitalism, I, I think you're onto something there. That some of these folks in the environmental movement just don't like. Um, freedom of choice because people choose things that are inconsistent with their particular beliefs. Yeah, and his, historically this is something I know a bit more about. I mean, the environmentalist movement arose at a very specific time, which was after the well-publicized failure of communism and after the Vietnam War was the cause of the day for the left. They they picked this cause, and it's not as if pollution had been increasing. It had been uh, decreasing. Well, we are uh, running out of time. Um, so let me ask as a final question, what, you know, what do you want uh, the audience to take away most from all of this? What I want the uh, audience to take away most, I suppose, is that they don't have to fear about the climate uh, turning around and, and harming them. We have the evidence that it's not changing much and to be skeptical, to be skeptical of those who are paid to have a view and paid to have an agenda. Always be skeptical when someone seems to know what the answer is for the future when they really can't predict it. And I guess I would add one, one lesson that was really cemented to me by this interview was just the particularly not just being skeptical as such, but, but demanding an explanation, asking, you shouldn't be afraid to ask someone how did you prove this? That's a legitimate sci- question to ask any scientist. And if they, if they, uh, you know, blanch at that question, that's a cause for suspicion. Yes, the cause for suspicion uh, comes, especially when someone says, "Oh, but the world scientists agree, or the government agency agrees." That's not an answer. You want to see the numbers? We produce those kinds of numbers, and that's the way to determine. All science is numbers, and that's what it comes down to. Thanks so much, Dr. Christie, for coming on the show. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks again to Dr. Christie for coming on the show. My number one takeaway, which I indicated during the show, was just the issue of being very rigorous that people prove or objectively support their claims and that you have every right as a consumer of you know, a given a given claim to ask the person, well, how do you how do you demonstrate this? And the fact that they have a certain kind of standing or prestige, that should just make them 
more likely to be able to give you one and to give you a good one. But if that's used in some way to make you take a conclusion on faith or to allow someone to get away with shoddy reasoning, uh, that's, you know, that's the reverse of the purpose of going to experts who are supposed to inform you, not misinform you via something that has nothing to do with actually proving a uh, point to you. So I, I just appreciated how when I would ask different questions, he would, he would always bring things back to what can you demonstrate, what can't you demonstrate, and just demanding that everyone do that. And I think that's, that's a model that, uh, that anyone uh, can follow. Also the point is about understanding that that scientists are human beings and who have the same, you know, who this is not some sort of, you know, I think human beings are inherently sinners, you know, not at all, but it's, it's understanding that there are certain uh, human beings have certain capacities for doing good and doing bad, and that there are different contexts that reward or punish uh, different capacities. So if we can look at a context of the, you know, the state of, of modern climate science, there's an enormous set of incentives directing people toward publicly voicing certain conclusions and not publicly voicing uh, others. And because that's not an honest process, it, that, that is an, a disincentive toward ethics uh, itself, which is a whole, whole long discussion. But uh, it's always, I think it's always good to hear that because we, we, do, we do get exposed to this view that, quote, the scientists are just these cosmic doctors or deities and... That, that, again, leads to not, not questioning. And it's not about being skeptical in the sense of just you don't believe anything and you, you won't listen to anyone and you think you're smarter than ever. It's just a matter of, no, you really, you're someone who really wants to understand the world. And for that to happen, you need to, a lot of times you need to say, hey, wait, I didn't understand that. Can you, can you explain that? And if somebody, unless you're super dense, if somebody begrudges uh, you know, acts begrudgingly about that, that's, that's not a good sign. They should be eager to uh, explain it. So those, those are two things I thought were really uh, interesting. That'll be it for the show. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at industrialprogress.net. Uh, as I tape this, it's Thursday. I'm going to be on uh, Stossel, the Stossel show on Fox Business, which also, also re-airs on Fox News, I believe, on Saturday. Uh, that's airing tonight, Thursday night, um, and Thursday the 17th, and it's the Earth Day special, so it's it's for Earth Day, I guess you, you could say, uh, which is on, on the 22nd, so make sure to check that out, share that with your friends. I'm going to be talking about the idea that I call human racism which is the bias that I think is really, really destructive and embedded in our society, that man-made things are bad and so-called natural things are good. And the reason I say so-called is that it is a real corruption to say that man is not natural. And if that's your view of natural, then you're saying, and you think natural is good, then when you're saying is good is non-man. And that is a whole, I mean, that is just about the worst view you can imagine. Anyway, uh, you'll learn more about that if, if you check out that appearance. Um, as always, go to industrialprogress.com to sign up for the newsletter, facebook.com slash the pursuit of energy for Facebook, facebook.com slash I love fossil fuels, and twitter.com at Alex Epstein. If you like Instagram, I'm at Alex Epstein22, uh, although that's not quite as, as uh, I'd say, energy dense in terms of, of interesting material. All right, that'll be it for this week. Um, next week, we will be back with another great topic, another great guest. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour, the antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.